it has endured. Our long national nightmare is over. Give me a break. That's a bunch of malarkey. Well, howdy. Welcome to Planet America. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chaz Tadella. This week, imagine waking up as an official guest at Buckingham Palace to discover back home your husband is embroiled in a sexting scandal. Awkward? We'll find out with Hillary Clinton's closest aide, Huma Aberdeen. Also this week, we're going to talk to the man who coined the phrase, the Great Resignation. Or maybe we'll just quit instead. No, there's too much news to cover. It's a fair bit. Let's do this. Authorities are bracing for possible unrest, whatever the verdict, in the trial of a teenager who shot three people, killing two of them, during protests last August in Kenosha, Wisconsin. 18-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse faces life in prison if convicted on all five counts. There's no doubt he shot the people. Most of the events were captured on camera. At issue is whether his claim of self-defence is justified. Shortly before the killings, Rittenhouse explained to a journalist why he'd travelled from Illinois to Wisconsin following the non-fatal police shooting of Kenosha man Jacob Blake. People are getting injured and our job is to protect this business and part of my job is to also help people. If there's somebody hurt, I'm running into harm's way. It wasn't his actual job. The then 17-year-old Rittenhouse was a self-appointed defender of property. He falsely claimed that he was old enough to possess a gun and that he was a certified medic when he was really just a lifeguard. Rittenhouse, who along with several others, including former Marines, armed himself with an AR-15 style assault rifle, slung it over his shoulder and walked for several hours around the protesters in Kenosha, claiming to be a medic. We should say, though, that he didn't just land there in the middle of the riot. Rittenhouse was spotted cleaning graffiti off a local high school earlier that day, and his friend testified at the trial that Rittenhouse did provide medical aid for at least one person on the night. As for falsely claiming he was old enough to possess a gun, one of the truly strange aspects of this trial was that Rittenhouse appeared to know more about Wisconsin's gun laws than the prosecutor did. This is where Rittenhouse explained why he had possession of an AR-15. Why did you pick or want Dominic Black to buy for you an AR-15 as opposed to a pistol or a shotgun or some other type of rifle? I cannot legally possess or carry a pistol because I'm not 18 in Wisconsin. I, I, I believe it's 18 in Wisconsin for a pistol. Um, but with the law... With the rifle, I knew, I knew I could possess that rifle. I knew I couldn't buy it, but I knew I could like take it to like the shooting range or possess it. So your understanding at that time was that Wisconsin law prohibited you as a 17-year-old from possessing a pistol, but you could have an AR-15? Yes. Now that sounds ridiculous, but he turned out to be right. The judge ended up dismissing the gun charge against Rittenhouse because he felt that Rittenhouse could only be convicted if the barrel of his rifle was less than 16 inches or the entire rifle had an overall length of less than 26 inches. <laughs> so since he had a nice big rifle, John, he wasn't breaking the law. And what a law it is. <laughs> what we do know, though, is this. Just before midnight on August 25th last year, Rittenhouse shot and killed unarmed Joseph Rosenbaum, a 36-year-old suffering from bipolar disorder who had just been released from hospital after a suicide attempt. Rittenhouse claimed Rosenbaum had been chasing him and threatening to kill him that evening. Video shows Rosenbaum throwing a plastic bag at Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse says he could not escape. There were about a hundred people surrounding that that those cars and there was no space for me to continue to run to. Okay. And so you turned around? Yes. And as you see him lunging at you, what do you do? I shoot him. And how many times did you shoot? I believe four. A Rittenhouse maintains in that moment he feared that his own gun would be taken and used against him. And in recounting those moments before the first killing, he certainly seemed fearful. There were three people right there. Take a deep breath, Kyle.
Two of the prosecution witnesses supported parts of Rittenhouse's story as well. Ryan Bouch testified that Rosenbaum was, quote, hyper-aggressive and acting out in a violent manner. And conservative journalist Richie McGuinness testified that Rosenbaum chased Rittenhouse into the parking lot and lunged for the front portion of Rittenhouse's rifle. The prosecutor questioned how McGuinness could possibly know what was in Rosenbaum's head, which led to this exchange. So your interpretation of what he was trying to do or what he was intending to do or anything along those lines is complete guesswork, isn't it? Um, well, he said, F you, and then he reached for the weapon. Also, a pathologist testified that Rosenbaum had soot injuries that could indicate he had his hand over the barrel of Rittenhouse's rifle. So, then, after killing Rosenbaum, Kyle Rittenhouse says that he ran away to escape from the mob, intending to turn himself into police. But before he could do that, a 26-year-old protester named Anthony Huber tried to take Rittenhouse's gun away from him, wielding his skateboard in his other hand. Rittenhouse shot and killed him. Seeing that was 27-year-old Gage Grosskreutz, a volunteer medic at several Black Lives Matter protests last year. He was also carrying a handgun and he approached Rittenhouse, believing him to be the active shooter. Why didn't you take your own gun and shoot the defendant first? Like I said, that's not the kind of person that I am. It's not why I was out there, that's not why I was out there for 75 days prior to that, why I spent up until that point, <laughs> spent my time, my money, my education providing care for people. Grosskreutz there really was the key witness because there's at least some evidence that both the first two people that Rittenhouse shot had attacked him. Whereas Grosskreutz, he appeared in the video that you just saw to just be standing there. So it would be difficult for Rittenhouse to claim that he was reasonably defending himself by shooting Grosskreutz. That was until this moment, possibly the most important of the trial. You'd agree your firearm is pointed at Mr. Rittenhouse, correct? Yes. Okay. And once your firearm is pointed at Mr. Rittenhouse, that's when he fires his gun. Yes? No. <laughs> Sir, we, look, I don't want to... Does this look like right now your arm is being shot? That looks like my bicep being vaporized, yes. Okay. And it's being vaporized because you're pointing your gun directly at him. Yes? Yes. Okay, so... When you were standing three to five feet from him with your arms up in the air, he never fired, right? Correct. Now, I, I played that clip long to show that originally Grosskreutz did not agree that he was pointing his gun at Rittenhouse when Rittenhouse shot him. The defence lawyer talked him into testifying that, and that's important because the footage that you saw is very blurry. And on TV a few days later, Grosskreutz said the exact opposite. So you're saying that you actually didn't, you weren't pointing your gun at him. Is that what you're saying? That's absolutely what I'm saying, yes. And there's also a photo from a different angle of the moment that Rittenhouse shot Grosskreutz. And it very much suggests that Grosskreutz was not pointing his gun at Rittenhouse when he was being shot. Now, that would call into question whether Rittenhouse was indeed reasonably defending himself. But Grosskreutz's testimony was his testimony. And if Rittenhouse is acquitted of all serious charges, that might be one of the main reasons why. It very well could be, yes. Rittenhouse shot Grosskreutz in the arm, ripping away most of his bicep, and then, still armed with his rifle, Kyle Rittenhouse fled this scene of chaos. He was even waved away by police. So he returned to his hometown of Antioch, Illinois, where he finally handed himself into authorities the following day. And just four days after that, the President of the United States provided him with a defence. He was trying to get away from them, I guess, it looks like, and he fell, and then they very violently attacked him, and it was something that we're looking at right now, and it's under investigation, but uh, 
I guess he was in very big trouble. He would have been, I, he probably would have been killed, but it's under, it's under investigation. That was late August last year. So Donald Trump at that point trying to drum up a law and order campaign to win re-election against Joe Biden. And those comments helped to make Rittenhouse a right-wing hero, standing up to Black Lives Matter protests, trying to keep the peace when police were holding back. And Trump's defence is still being echoed this week by the likes of Sean Hannity on Fox. Based on video evidence, and there is a lot of it, and eyewitness accounts, there was a lot of that as well, it is apparent that 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse was defending himself from imminent bodily harm or even death. In other words, exactly what the Wisconsin law allows for. And having just said that without a hint of irony, Sean Hannity reckons it's the rest of the media that prejudged this case. The mob, the media, their friends and the Democratic Party, they're all eager to vilify and have been from day one 18-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse. They all made up their minds months ago before any evidence was presented. They rushed to judgment. They obviously don't believe in due process. They don't believe in the presumption of innocence. He was enemy number one from day one. The politicization of this case has been extremely depressing, John. The MAGA heads have literally been claiming that Rittenhouse is Captain America and lefties like Cory Bush have alluded back to the Ferguson march when white supremacists were allegedly hiding behind a hill shooting at protesters. She suggested that if Rittenhouse is acquitted, it tells the white supremacists they can still get away with it. Look, there is no evidence that Rittenhouse is a white supremacist and he certainly wasn't picking protesters off from behind hills. But in today's environment, there's no room for nuance. Mm. 500 of the Wisconsin National Guard are standing by waiting for what comes next. Well, Chez, there was another hugely political legal case this week. This morning, former Trump advisor and confidant Steve Bannon under indictment by a federal grand jury charged with two counts of contempt of Congress for failing to comply with a subpoena issued by the January 6th investigators. Bannon has claimed executive privilege as the reason for refusing to talk to members of Congress investigating the January 6th insurrection. They want to ask him about predictions that he was making the day before those deadly attacks on the Capitol building like this. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. Well, Bannon's indictment is rare, and the only time that anyone invoking executive privilege has been hauled before a court like this, and that's because that claim is pretty tenuous. Bannon stopped formally working for the executive branch in 2017, more than three years before the events of January 6th. And after his brief court appearance this week, where Bannon was released without requiring to post bail, he was vowing to fight on. And we're going to do, we're going to go on the offense. We're tired of playing defense. We're going to go on the offense on this and stand by. They, by the way, by the way, by the way, you should understand, Nancy Pelosi took, is taking on Donald Trump and Steve Bannon. She ought to ask Hillary Clinton how that turned out for them, okay? We're going on the offense. I could be a cynic here, Chaz, but being dragged before a court seemed to be exactly what Steve Bannon has been hoping for. He live-streamed his own arrival at the courthouse, and it was very, very big news across the networks. Meanwhile, Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, is next in the committee's sights after failing to appear for a scheduled deposition last week. He, too, faces a possible contempt of Congress charge. And the first keep on coming, it's also the first prosecution of a contempt of Congress referral since 1983. Well, done Steve Bannon. That means Bannon's facing two counts of 30 days to one year in jail and a fine. Bannon's not going to be worried about that though. To obtain a conviction you need to show that Bannon is acting with improper intent. He's just going to say he was following his lawyer's advice. In the past federal courts have ruled that to be a complete defence for criminal contempt. This is basically just Bannon wasting time. Team Trump knows that in 14 months' time, the likely incoming Republican Congress is going to end this commission. So the more time they waste messing with Steve Bannon, the less time they have to work on witnesses who have stronger executive privilege cases like Mark Meadows, who was, of course, Trump's chief of staff. He might have a real claim. Meadows says it would be irresponsible for him to voluntarily waive executive privilege while it's still being adjudicated in court. Maybe so, but that doesn't explain why he isn't answering any questions, even ones that have nothing to do with privilege. Like, was he using a private cell phone on January 6th? And where are his text messages from the day? 
This is going to be the courtroom equivalent of an athlete untying and retying their shoes for 14 straight months, John. Yeah, they're running down the clock. Meanwhile, there's a new book out this week on the dying days of the Trump administration. It's called Betrayal by Jonathan Carl, Chief White House Correspondent for ABC America. And it does make for some eye-catching reading. In the course of a 90-minute interview for this book conducted at Mar-a-Lago in the lobby of the golf club, former President Trump fails to condemn the January 6 rioters, even seeming to justify their threats to execute his vice president, Mike Pence, because he refused to stop the recognition of Joe Biden's election win. Were you worried about him during that, that siege? Were you worried about no, his safety? No, I thought he was well protected, and I, I had heard that he was in good shape. No, you I heard those chants. That was terrible. I mean, was, you know, the... He could have... Well, the people were very angry. They were saying, hang Mike Because Pence. It's, it's common sense. How can you... If you know a vote is fraudulent, right, yeah. how can you pass on a fraudulent vote to Congress? And later in that interview, Trump basically confirmed details of the ongoing White House campaign to pressure Mike Pence into overturning the election. If Pence did what you wanted, you think you would still be in the White House? I think we would have won, yeah. Can you ever forgive him for that? Uh, I don't know, because uh, um, I picked him, I like him, I still like him. But I don't know that I can forgive him. So it remains to be seen whether anyone like Steve Bannon, much less Donald Trump, ever see the inside of a jail cell for their actions around the January 6th attack on American democracy. But Jacob Chansley, the painted face of the insurrection, was sentenced to three and a half years behind bars this week. Chansley, otherwise known as the QAnon shaman, pleaded guilty to one count of obstruction of an official proceeding. And he was showing plenty of remorse during this week's sentencing hearing, saying, I'm to blame, and that he really messed up. Word, Jacob. President Biden finally got his photo op this week, though, and a trillion dollars to spend on roads, rail and bridges, signing into law that bipartisan infrastructure bill. I truly believe that 50 years from now, historians are going to look back at this moment and say, that's the moment America began to win the competition of the 21st century. So with confidence, optimism, with vision and faith in each other, let's believe in possibilities. Let's believe in one another and let's believe in America. God bless you all and may God protect our troops. Now let me sign this bipartisan bill. Technically bipartisan, but only six of the 19 Republican senators who voted for the bill turned up to see it signed. Usual suspects like Mikowski, Collins and Romney, plus Rob Portman of Ohio. They all get a White House pen. Absent, though, and conspicuous in doing so, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, senior senators like Lindsey Graham, a whole bunch of others who clearly, even though they supported it, did not want to be seen in the same room as Joe Biden, even if that room is the South Lawn of the White House. President Biden, for his part, then hit the road to try and sell this infrastructure package, picking a rusty old bridge in New Hampshire as his backdrop. This may not seem like a big bridge, but it saves lives and solves problems. Let me tell you why. Businesses depend on it, like the local propane company or the sand and gravel company or the logging trucks or the public services depend on it, school buses, wastewater trucks, cross it every day. He's going to need to sell hard, John. Morning Consult only found 50% support for the bill last week, down from 58% three months earlier when it was passed by the Senate. Now, that's largely because Republican support has dropped from 40% to 22%. They've been working on this bill on Fox News. Mm -hmm. But there's a broader issue here for Biden in a Washington Post poll, which is more than 6 in 10 Americans, including 71% of independents, say that Biden has not accomplished much. So he's going to want to sell this package real hard, John, because he can't spend much more money. Yes, well, as for accomplishments, Biden is still urging Congress to pass that even larger social spending bill this month, while moderate Democrat Joe Manchin is trying to tap the brakes still. He's worried about inflation, which is at a 30-year high. I hear it when I go to the grocery store or if I go to the gas station. They say, are you as mad as I am? And I says, absolutely. But back on that rusty bridge, Joe Biden was sounding confident that he will get all the votes he needs. I'm, uh, I'm confident that the House is going to pass this bill. And when it passes, it'll go to the Senate. I think we'll get it passed within a week. Well, we will soon see. The Independent Congressional Budget Office, the CBO, released its costings earlier today. No great surprises in it, predicting it will cost $1.7 trillion over a decade, adding $367 billion to the deficit. And that 
essentially gave Speaker Nancy Pelosi a green light to at least bring on a House vote. Yeah, but House vote's one thing. The Senate vote's the one that matters, mm -hmm. with our old friend Joe Manchin, who's very worried about inflation. He's not the only one, either. A Progressive Policy Institute poll of 44 swing districts and nine swing states, they found 74% of voters were concerned that two spending bills would overheat the economy and cause inflation to rise. And they included 49% of self-described Liberals. So that inflation attack is biting. So much so that Biden has taken to selling his spending bills as the cure for inflation. If your number one issue is the cost of living, the number one priority should be seeing Congress pass these bills. 17 Nobel Prize winners in economics have said, spontaneously wrote to me together, and said this will lower inflationary pressure on the economy when we pass my bills. A new analysis from the Wall Street firm of Moody's Analytics found that it will ease the financial burden of inflation for middle-class families. OK, that needs breaking down. Firstly, the 17 Nobel laureates who spontaneously wrote that letter wrote it two months ago when the spending package was very different. Secondly, they specifically said the critical key components of the agenda included tax reforms that make our tax system more equitable. Well, those reforms are all now gone from the package and they've been replaced by a big tax break for rich blue staters. And even then, the Nobel laureates only said that this would ease long-term inflationary pressures. Long-term. Guess what word Biden left out there? This will lower inflationary pressure on the economy. And as for that reference that Biden made to Moody's before, their latest assessment of the spending package is that the spending and tax cuts will outweigh the revenue by $120 billion next year. And it'll take until 2027 before the package is in the black. Having said all that, Moody's is only projecting that by the end of next year, inflation would be 2.5% with the spending package and 2.1% without it. So it's not a big deal either way. Also, to be fair, the Democrat who's been obsessed with inflation all year, Larry Summers, isn't worried about the inflationary impact of these spending bills. The 10 years of the two spending bills together, A, are less than the one year of what they did last spring, and B, unlike what they did last spring, are paid for by uh, tax increases. So I don't think that's an inflation uh, problem. I think a lot of it is vitally needed uh, investments in the future of our country. Maybe so, but this stopped being about logic months ago, mm -hmm. John. What's about now is Joe Manchin, just how he likes it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, in a moment, we're going to be speaking to Huma Aberdeen, long-time advisor to Hillary Clinton, former wife of the disgraced former Congressman Anthony Weiner, about her new memoir. But first, a bit of background to jog your memory. It's July 23rd, 2013. There you go. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. My name is Anthony Weiner, Democratic candidate for mayor of the city of New York. The Democratic frontrunner to become the next mayor of New York calling a press conference wouldn't normally be a national, much less international, news event, but Anthony Weiner isn't just any candidate for mayor. He has baggage. As I've said in the past, these things that I did were wrong and hurtful to my wife and caused us to go through many challenges in our marriage that extended past my resignation from Congress. That resignation was two years earlier when Anthony Weiner's promising political career had seemed over. It came from Congressman Anthony Weiner's Twitter account over the weekend, a photo of an anonymous man's bulging underwear. The lewd picture, immediately deleted from Weiner's account, was sent to this 21-year-old Seattle college student, but also available to the public to view on Twitter. Weiner initially denied he'd tweeted the photo of his <laughs> namesake. Uh, this seems like a prank that has gotten an enormous amount of attention. This is the picture. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it by now. Is this you? I can tell you this. We have a firm that we've hired to... I've seen it. It's... I've seen it. Yeah, like every time he looked down. For a few days, Weiner maintained he'd been hacked before admitting his lie. And his humiliation seemed complete. So today I'm announcing my resignation from Congress. Yeah! Bye-bye, pervert! 
so my colleagues can get back to work, my neighbors can choose a new representative, and most importantly, that my wife and I can continue to heal from the damage I have caused. And Anthony Weiner wasn't just any congressman either. A fixture on cable news, Weiner's wife, Huma Aberdeen, was one of the most trusted advisers to US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Anthony he Weiner. was still well connected and very ambitious. And perhaps recognizing his run for New York mayor was his last shot at redemption, this time he would not be quitting. I hope they're willing to still continue to give me a second chance. And I hope they realize that, in many ways, um, what happened today was something that, frankly, had happened before, but it doesn't represent all that much that is new. Nice try, but the latest sexts were from the year after he quit Congress. He'd been up to his old tricks again before running for mayor. Now he was trying to convince voters that was all in the past. Helping him to make that implausible claim was his wife. Huma Aberdeen. But this is the first time I've spoken at a press conference and um, you'll have to bear with me because I'm very nervous. She argued if she could forgive her husband's indiscretions, maybe voters should too. Our marriage, like many others, has had its ups and its downs. It took a lot of work and a whole lot of therapy to get to a place where I could forgive Anthony. The Clintons were reportedly concerned Weiner would prove to be a liability for them in the future. And while Bill and Hillary have not gone public, aides and advisors say they're eager to see Weiner exit the race before damage is done to a possible Clinton run for the presidency, reminding voters of the Clintons' own sex scandal, with Hillary Clinton standing by her man. I'm sitting here because I love him. And I respect him. Come Democratic primary day, fewer than 5% of New Yorkers had forgiven Anthony Weiner enough to vote for him. And that seemed like maybe the last time we'd hear from him, except as the punchline to a joke. But then came the election of 2016. Huma Aberdeen is still by the side of Hillary Clinton, who seems destined to become the first female president, despite concerns she may have been a little lax with security using a private email account as Secretary of State. She was up against this guy. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh, I don't remember. He's going like, I don't remember. I had the, oh, maybe that's what I said. But then... Anthony Weiner in more trouble for him. Child Services is now investigating the former congressman after his latest round of sexting, which included a photo showing his young son in the background. And the saga still wasn't over. 11 days to the election, the FBI director informing lawmakers he is reviewing new emails related to the Clinton email investigation. Law enforcement officials tell CNN the new emails were not from Clinton, but were sent and received by aide Huma Abedin. They were found on a device shared by Abedin and her estranged husband, Anthony Weiner, who was the target of a separate investigation into alleged sexting with a minor. Wow. Wow, indeed. It's true. <laughs> It seems Anthony Weiner is forcing the nation to relitigate the entire email controversy and putting Hillary Clinton's chances of winning the presidency in serious danger. The FBI found nothing new relating to their Clinton email investigation on Weiner's laptop, but the damage was done. It reminded enough voters about the Clinton scandals, the secrecy, the lies, the email affair, 25 years of it. Pollsters say Comey's brief reopening of the Clinton investigation was the final straw, sending Donald Trump to the White House. Meanwhile, Anthony Weiner was sent to jail for a year and a half for sexting with a minor, and he remains a registered sex offender for life. So, what was it like to be at the centre of that storm, and indeed all of the storms, from Lewinsky Gate through to Weiner Gate? Huma Aberdeen has written her side of those stories and more in her new memoir, Both and A Life in Many Worlds, where she goes back to her childhood, growing up Muslim in Michigan and then Saudi Arabia, her path to the White House and what she calls Hillary Land, and then, of course, the collision of very public and private events. Huma Aberdeen, welcome to Planet America. John, thank you for having me on the show. I'm looking forward to our conversation. 
when you first started working with Hillary Clinton in 1998, she had literally just found out that her husband had lied to her and indeed the nation about his affair with Monica Lewinsky. When you, many years later, found yourself in a not dissimilar public scandal because of your husband, Anthony Weiner, uh, did you draw on that experience at all or did you see them as sort of entirely different? You know, I didn't because I think no two uh, situations are necessarily the same or even comparable. I, I think what she was going through uh, was a historic, uh, had, you know, every decision she made, the stress and the pressure upon her was uh, overwhelming. And when I had to go through my own personal challenges many years later, uh, you know, I, in that moment, I was so stunned and so shocked. I just tried to do the next best right thing for myself. I, you know, it was such different circumstances. You know, I was newly married. I was, you know, I tell the story of waking up at Buckingham Palace and knowing I was, you know, newly pregnant, carrying my secret, living this perfect life, having married the man who I believed was the love of my life. He was my, certainly my first love. He was the first man I had ever been with. Uh, so for me, it was just this earth shattering, shocking revelation. But, uh, you know, I had to manage my way through and it took several years to, to get through to get through that process, to be able to be here sitting with you and being on the other side, having written this book and happy to have shared my story. In our introduction there, Huma, we just saw a, a clip of you at that press conference standing by the side of your husband, Anthony Weiner, when he was running for mayor in 2013 and speaking out in his defence. You said at the time you were very nervous. How hard was that to do for you? Well, taking people back to that moment, you know, I think there's a tendency to look at my relationship with Anthony from a 2020 21 perspective and hindsight is certainly 2020. Um, but in the moment, you know, I was, as I said, just trying to do what I thought was the next best right thing. And I also didn't understand, you know, John, I don't believe what I went through is necessarily so singular. Unfortunately, I think it is something that women and couples and people go through challenges in their relationships, infidelity did not, was not invented in, uh, in my case. I just had to do it on the front page of the newspaper. And, you know, as I recount in the book, um, you know, as we were doing research for this book, my colleague came to me and said, the most common headline about you from that period of time is what is wrong with her and what is she thinking? And so I chose to write exactly what I was thinking. And, you know, in the 2013, I stood at that press conference because I had agreed, encouraged Anthony to run the, the first time the scandal had broken. I had you know, thought it was this anomaly. I didn't understand the behavior. I thought it was something he could easily knock off. And I saw him running for office as a way to, you know, re uh, uh, reestablish himself in society, in the community. He was a good public servant. He was a very popular member of Congress uh, before he resigned in 2011. And I saw this as a path back. It was a mistake in hindsight for him to run. But I stood with him because I had uh, I had felt like I owed people an answer and I had to take responsibility for my decision. I wonder, I mean, it happened to Hillary Clinton in the 1990s. It happened to you more recently, this idea that for standing by your husband, you were somehow to blame or complicit or responsible for his infidelities and his scandals. What do you think that is about? I didn't, you know, I didn't know how to deal with it. I'd never, you know, I didn't grow up in the a family. You know, I came from an immigrant family, came to this country to pursue the American dream. I grew up in Saudi Arabia. It was not an environment where we went to talk to strangers about our problems. And, and I had nothing. I didn't know any parents uh, who were divorced uh, when I was growing up in Saudi Arabia. It was a, this was entirely a new, uh, a new space and place for me to explore. I did feel as though, you know, we were in a bunker together uh, right at the beginning. You know, you, you know, the disinviting from parties, the being asked, you know, volunteering at a food bank and being asked not to come. And so, yes, I mean, the shunning to some extent, certainly I had a very supportive family and a very, very supportive group of friends, but nobody really knew what to do or how to help us. I mean, sort of they were just there to be there. But in terms of seeking professional help, that's something we had to do on our own. And it also took a very long time to understand the behavior. I think mental health, you know, in part, as I've had been on this book tour around the country, I have to tell you, John, every single day I will meet somebody or get a message from somebody who says they understand. And people who will say, I don't understand. It is in 
in, in my opinion, people who, um, or in my judgment, people who just never had to live with somebody, don't have a partner or a parent or a child who's either dealt um, with mental health issues or addiction, you know, addictive behavior. Um, and it took me many years to, you know, understand what I was dealing with and, you know, who I was living with. Can, can you explain to us what your feelings were in 2016 at the height of this campaign where your boss of almost 20 years, who's now more of a friend, is about to become, it seems, the first female president of the United States. Your husband's laptop computers and his old sexting scandal suddenly mean Jim Comey opens up an investigation once again and it costs her the election. How mortifying was that? Well, you know, 2016, uh, and I share the stories in the book about what it felt, you know, that night in uh, Philadelphia in July 28th, 2016, when Hillary Clinton was officially the first uh, female presidential nominee of our party. I, uh, I recounted how the feeling in the room, the pounding on the floor was so intense. I thought we were going to fall through the energy, the excitement, the history she had just made for generations of women and girls in this country that you know, something we could carry forward with a tremendous amount of pride. There was so much excitement. So yes, for 11 days before our election, for this unprecedented announcement from the then FBI director in an election that was this close, every little thing mattered. And this was a big thing. And there were already plenty of external forces as you know, Hillary has recounted herself in her own book, everything from foreign government intervention, so from to challenge, you know, fake ads on social media. I mean, it was the incoming was constant. I write a whole uh, passage in the book about the sexism, the constant sexist remarks she had to endure. It was constantly challenges thrown at her, the fake news that was just prevalent. People we'd run into who would believe these rumors that she was dying or some horrible, you know, accusations that we just dismissed as nonsense. All of these things were seeded in that election. So this final earthquake um, was devastating. And then for two days before, uh, for, for there to be a, another announcement saying there is nothing new and there's nothing to report, uh, I think uh, hurt us even more. It was, it was so traumatic, so devastating, as I write in the book. I had even, I was so stunned I had stopped feeling because feeling for myself felt selfish in that moment. It was about the mission. It was about November 8th. It was about getting her elected. And we all know how that ended. Huma Aberdeen, when you hear people say, Hillary Clinton, she didn't win the presidency either time she ran because she's just not likeable. She rubs people up the wrong way. Uh, what do you put that down to? Is that is that her gender? Is it something about her personality? Is it something about the rest of us? What do you think? Well, you know, it's one of the many reasons I wrote the book. You know, as I say in the end of the book, I, you know, I try to approach this book as a show, not tell. It's not telling you this and telling you that. I try to show people what it was like. I take people onto Air Force One with us. I take people into the Situation Room or into the meetings at the State Department. What were the motivations of this woman? Or actually, whether it was Hillary Clinton or Bill Clinton or Barack Obama, all of whom I had the privilege to serve with, what, you know, revealing the kind of, and John McCain, even the other side of the aisle, Lindsey Graham, Republican senators who, um, you know, who uh, Hillary worked with, this idea of what American leaders, what motivated them, their values and their principles, which I hope I have done justice to in the book. Uh, I tell a story in 2016 about traveling to a fundraiser, uh, uh, speaking on behalf of the, the campaign, a surrogate as we call it. And as I gave the speech, and I was very nervous about public speaking, I'm terrified of public speaking. I um, I finish, I just get up and give a personal story. And when I, when I finish, one of the audience members gets up and says, I don't understand why doesn't Hillary talk about herself this way? I mean, these stories are amazing. And I said then, which is what I still believe, is that she never believed it was about her. She was a serious, you know, policy driven. She was solution driven. Everything about what animated her got her up in the morning was how do I make every man, woman and child in this country's life better, easier, more prosperous and more fair. And she, for the most part, ignored the little personal, you know, uh, attacks. And for many years that worked in the 1990s, you know, John, when I grew up in the Clinton world of politics in the 1990s, it was just the beginning of the 24-hour cable news uh, shows. 
you had a proactive message you drove every single day. So whether that was healthcare or education, that was the message you talked about every day and you ignored any of the nonsensical fake news that might be percolating. Now, as we learned in 2016, we live in a 24 second news cycle. So you, you have, and, and as you know, I think we learned late, you have to respond, you have to counterattack. You can't, you cannot assume people are not gonna believe nonsense because as we learned in the aftermath of 2016, people believed plenty of nonsense in this country. And I hope when you close this book, that you will see, and I hope I've done a good job, that you know she would have been an extraordinary president uh, of the United States, and not because she was the most qualified woman to run in this country, because I believe she was the most qualified person. Huma Aberdeen, a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for being with us on Planet America. John, thrilled to be talking to you. Thank you for taking the time, I appreciate it. Here's the deal. Yes, here's the deal. October was an encouraging month for jobs. The Bureau of Labor Statistics announced on a website that apparently hasn't been updated since 1996 that there were 531,000 new jobs and a 4.6% unemployment rate. So we should celebrate that, or at least BLS style. Yay, moderately encouraging results. Nevertheless, the very same week, Gallup announced that 68% of the country said the economy is getting worse. Oh. That's slightly contradictory, isn't it? Oh, well, yes, but not as contradictory as the very same press release declaring a record high 74% of people saying it's a good time to find a quality job. While they're saying the economy's getting worse. Weird. But workers at least are acting like this is a good time to get a job. Last month saw 4.4 million people quitting their jobs. Huge record. That's 3% of the workforce right there. All have the confidence to quit. And it's rising fast as well. Especially in the accommodation and restaurant industries, 6.6% of their workers quit in September alone. This has been the story all year. A record 34 and a half million workers have quit so far this year. Almost three million more than the next most quits during the boom economy of 2019. And workers aren't just quitting either. They've been striking as well. So much so that last month was apparently officially renamed Striketober hashtag. I missed that announcement. Approval of labor unions is up to 68% in America now as well. That's a 50 year high, which kind of reminds me of that song. What? What's that song? Won't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? Yes, that's the song. You've got to fight for your right to party. Yes. Anyway, the point is this is a good time to be a worker. Yeah? Well, there are heaps of job openings at least. 10.4 million jobs available, but only 7.4 million unemployed workers chasing those jobs. Very rare to see more job openings than unemployed workers chasing those jobs. Only happens in booms. So that's why workers are feeling so powerful then? Okay. So why is it then that after a bunch of people dropped out of the workforce because of COVID, and then about half those people came right back, the other half never returned. Since that mini bounce back there, the participation rate stayed pretty much the same. Where have all these workers gone? Well, there are a few theories. Firstly, at least three million workers have retired early. That accounts for about half the missing workers. And well, how do we know that they've retired early, you might ask? Because the trend line for the percentage of the population that's retired was pretty clear until the pandemic and then there was this sudden jump. These are the early retirees. How do we know that those retirees won't come back? Well, remember our participation rate graph. They remember there was this bounce back of half the missing workers and it stayed kind of still. Well, there was a similar bounce back for older workers. These are the 55 pluses. So they had to bounce back and then the second COVID wave hit and they just said, bugger it. The participation rate dropped back down and they've all stayed home. Hasn't budged since. Next theory is the fear of COVID. Between about 20 and about 50% of workers have felt uncomfortable about returning to an office environment all year because of COVID. Even now, when the threat is as low as it's been, 
Still, only 73% of people feel comfortable returning to work. And there's another theory as well that uh, workers are hanging back because the government is showering them with benefits. Americans have accumulated $2.3 trillion more in savings than you'd expect during the pandemic period. That's true. Their median household checking account is twice what it was in 2019. The stimulus, it's worked. And parents, they're still getting child tax credits of $300 per month per child. So yes, that's a lot of money. But after the government stopped paying out generous unemployment benefits a few months back, studies found that they'd only played a small role in labour shortages and that there had been at most a modest increase in employment when states abandoned the program. So maybe the extra money didn't make a difference. Besides, if anything, the quits have increased in the last couple of months since the free money eased off. Okay, how about then childcare issues? That's a good theory. A study in October found 1.3 million fewer employed mothers than before the pandemic, but only 730,000 fewer employed fathers, and only 320,000 fewer employed men and women without kids. So that might suggest that childcare could be a factor. One more theory as well. Some employees may be hanging out for better wages. Certainly those who've kept their jobs over the past year have only seen a 3.5% increase in their wages, whereas those who've switched jobs have seen a 5.4% increase in their wages. And I don't think it's a coincidence. It's the restaurant industry where everyone's been quitting recently, where wages have increased the most. So anyway, those are some of the theories. That's five of them at least. For what it's worth, JP Morgan's on their own calculations. They estimate 35% of the issue is people relying on savings, 20% is early retirements, 10% is issues renewing work visas, 10% are people becoming self-employed, and 25% is people worried about COVID or having childcare issues. Just one thing, most of these here, they're American domestic issues. But this is a global problem. The OECD has found that 20 million fewer people in work than there were before the pandemic, with 14 million of those people having completely exited the workforce. And there are related observations being made in Western Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean and China and Vietnam and so on. Enter our next guest, who has a very different theory. Chaz. <gasps> yes, here's the deal. Thanks, Chaz. All the way back in May, Dr. Anthony Klotz declared the great resignation is coming. He was referring to what happens when people reassess their family time, remote work, commuting, passion projects, life and death and what it all means. John, people are certainly paying attention to him now. For shizzle, Chaz. And he's joining us now, Dr. Anthony Klotz, psychologist and professor of business administration at the Texas A&M University. Welcome to Planet America. Thank you very much. Can you estimate for us how much of what you term as the great resignation is in fact just people playing catch up? Uh, they didn't want to leave their jobs during the pandemic, but now they're happily moving on. Yeah, so we don't have an exact percentage of what percentage of these resignations are being driven by just a backlog in the market individuals who stayed in place in 2020. But there are many anecdotal reports and a lot of reports coming out that people are leaving jobs due to reasons other than just simply staying in place. So reasons such as burnout, reasons such as having epiphanies during the pandemic. And so while we don't have a good breakdown, there are indications that a large percentage of the resignations that we're seeing are not merely a backlog, but they're driven to other forces unique to the pandemic. Okay, so what exactly is your theory for what's going on then? Yeah, so my theory is that the pandemic caused four different factors that are somewhat unique to this period in time that are driving people to resign. And that's why there's no real easy solutions to it because it's a fairly complex problem. So not only the backlog and resignations that you mentioned, but the pandemic was a unique time of burnout for employees. And, and of course that includes our frontline workers, but it also includes employees at all levels of the organization who were firefighting through the pandemic, managing through the pandemic. And then even individuals who worked from home, uh, especially caregivers struggled with working from home and working remotely. And so we know burnout is a predictor of turnover. And so that's part of what's driving it as well. And then we did see a number of individuals who reflected on the place of work in their lives during the pandemic. And a number of people liked where work was at in their lives, but some percentage 
are looking for a change coming out of the pandemic as a result of those reflections. And then finally, there is a bit of a reshuffling, of course, that has to do with remote work now being such a big part of our economy and hybrid work being part of our economy as employees gravitate towards the work arrangement that they would prefer going forward, whether that's in person, remote or hybrid. Doctor, the old adage goes, don't make big life decisions when you're grieving. And literally millions of Americans are grieving now over people who've died from COVID. There's been a big economic disruption as well. Is now the time to be making big decisions like quitting your job? Well, there's probably two answers to that. And the first one is, is you're exactly right. Um, this is a big decision to quit your job. And so individuals should think long uh, and deeply before they actually do that. And I think now is a great opportunity because employers are very interested in how to retain employees. Now is a great time instead of quitting to maybe talk to your boss about how to recraft or restructure your job to align it more with your looking for post pandemic in this stage of your career. At the same time, in a number of industries, there are lots of job openings. So there are record job openings in the United States. So from that perspective, in some industries, there may be lower cost than ever to leaving your job because of how many job openings are that are in the industry that you're in. Now that's somewhat industry specific. And so workers need to um, make sure they look before they leap in terms of that job market. Um, so it is a big decision, but at the same time with the job openings we have, there may be a little bit lower risk than there has been in the past. Dr. Klotz, if there are burnouts such as frontline workers or caregivers, or there is a push, as you say, for more remote work, then why are the industries where there's the most quitting, the ones that have nothing to do with burnouts or remote work, like restaurants and accommodation? Well, those are the industries, service work, accommodation, and healthcare that were really stretched thin during the pandemic. And there's probably a couple things going on. One is just the overwork has led to burnout. And, it, and it's not just overwork, but overwork during a time of personal stress in a lot of our lives. So when individuals would normally go home in the evening or on weekends or on vacation to recover from work, the pandemic and some of other this, the other stressors were still there. And so it didn't give them a chance to recover. And so that's particularly challenging. At the same time, when individuals are overworking, they're also probably saving some money or making more money than they normally would. So there is a statistic here that in 2020, uh, savings went up, household debt went down in the United States, which is not a common thing at all. And so you can imagine these industries are the ones that have a lot of job openings right now. And so if you're an individual who's in one of those industries and you're burnt out and you saved a little bit of money, this may be a time to take a little bit of time off of work or to go back to school or to enact some other plans that maybe you've saved up a little money and are able to pursue. Finally, doctor, given that you predicted what is happening right now, what's your prediction now for what's gonna happen next? Yeah, well, I'm really careful after getting one prediction right um, to not make any more and just stay one for one uh, on those. But I, I do think this will, we're entering a period of time in which organizations are really experimenting with different ways of working, different ways of interacting with their employees and are collecting a lot of data in terms of can employees be as productive working hybrid and remote? I think the answer is yes. Are employees as innovative working in those situations? I think a lot of companies are asking that and trying to find those answers. So there is going to be this period of um, movement that happens as employees try to find the organizations that really fit how they feel post pandemic and companies change to figure out who they are going forward. And so I think we're entering a period of time with elevated resignations but the end of that, whether it's in two years or five years, and I think it will be somewhere between there, is a better world of work with more options and benefits for employees. And if that comes true, then that's at least one nice silver lining from the pandemic is improving the world of work from what it was in 2019. And it did have a lot of room to improve from there. Dr. Klotz, we appreciate your time. Thank you for being with us on Planet America. Thank you very much. And that is it for another action-packed trip to Planet America. You will find the full interview with Huma Aberdeen on ABC iView and online as well. More at the same time next week, plus a very peppy pet podcast for you as well right there. Good night. <laughs>